Now, with all that being said, let's jump into our lesson. Keep your Bibles at 1 Timothy 1, as that's going to be where our main text comes from. We have another text in our introduction that we'll look at in just a moment from 1 Corinthians 15. But I will start by way of explanation, because I have been here four and a half years now, and there is, I think, an impression about me that I want to clear up. You think that I'm persnickety about things, especially things that I eat or that I drink, and I'll I'll own up to some of that. Um, In in previous lessons, I've made the comment that I don't drink generic brand soda. Like, it don't, just, I don't, I don't, the Kroger brand, like whatever it is, you know, great value brand, I'm not going to drink, I'm not going to drink, if it's not Coca-Cola, then I'm I'm not going to drink it. And It's not because I'm like snooty or persnickety. I think that's the impression that you have about it is that I don't drink very much soda because of all the calories that are in soda. And so my my idea is when I drink soda, it's got to be the real thing. If I'm going to use the calories on it, it's not just going to be water and high fructose corn syrup with some coloring in it. It has to be the real thing. I like the flavor of the real thing, and nothing beats a Coca-Cola as far as it being a well-defined, bold, and delicious flavor. Pepsi has citric acid in it, which completely ruins it. On a chemical level, Pepsi is garbage. (laughs) I will acknowledge that Dr. Pepper is a very complicated and bold flavor, but Dr. Pepper's not my favorite. This is where I'm going with this, because there's actually a point, I promise. These introductions are well-designed and well-thought-through. I spent all week doing it. I like that a real Coca-Cola has a well-defined flavor. A lot of the generic brands just don't have flavor to them. Again, it's like water and high-fructose corn syrup, and you're just... This is a brown soda, and this is a clear soda, and you can't really tell much difference as far as it being an actual discernible flavor to it. I like well-defined flavors in the things that I eat, the things that I drink. That's why I am like that. Now, here's where I'm going with this. I think that we also have to be well-defined people. And in terms of our priorities, our morals, the things that we say and our behaviors, we cannot just be muddy, flavored, and indiscernible from the world around us. There has to be something distinctive and powerful about the way that we speak and live so that when somebody looks at your life, you're not just their co-worker who's just like every one of their co-workers. You're not just their neighbor who's like every one of their neighbors. You're not just another person in this person's life. You are discernible as something unique, as something special, as something deeply spiritual and changed and altered by an otherworldly power. And if you do not have a discernible taste in a world full of sin, then who's to say you're not any less sinful than the world around you? Paul makes an interesting point in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I love a phrase that he's, I'm going to seize upon it here in just a moment, but in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 9 and 10, the apostle has this to say, after introducing the basics of the gospel message, he says, For I am the least of the apostles, and not really fit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God with me. I love that phrase that he uses. I am what I am. And it is by the grace of God. I am what I am. Now, Paul is not saying that as a take it or leave it, I am what I am. That's not how he means it, because that's sometimes we say that phrase. We dismiss our faults In our our horrible character flaws, we say, well, I am what I am. If you don't love it, then leave it. That's not what Paul's saying here. 
He is saying, look at what I've become because of the grace of God. I am only what I am because of God's grace. I am the least of all. I'm garbage without God's grace. I am what I am now. I'm an apostle. I'm saved. I'm living in the light. I am what I am because of God's grace. And sometimes we really struggle to know who we are until we leave that definition up to God. It is in God, by his grace, that we are most honorably defined. Otherwise, what are you? You know, when you meet somebody, what's, what's almost always the first like point of conversation that you have when you meet someone new? It's always, well, where are you from? What do you do for a living? It's stuff like that. Are you more than an accountant? Are you more than a chemical engineer? Are you more than, are you more than your job? Are you more than just attachment to a geographic location? I'm an Oregonian, I'm a Californian, I'm a Mississippian, whatever it happens to be. Are you more than that? Because I think we really struggle with that sometimes. Even worse, we struggle when we make our life into segmented little boxes that from the hours of here to here, I am this thing, and then I go home, and then I'm this thing, and then it's Sunday morning, and it's 11 o'clock, and I'm this thing, and we're just things in little boxes instead of one defining characteristic that's life-altering and life-saturating. We are created in God's image. We see that in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, that from the dust God forms man and he brings forth Eve from a rib of Adam. He makes man and woman to be creatures in his image. And he imprinted upon us a set of spiritual and moral qualities that cannot be found in any other part of creation. Do you realize that? That in spite of everything that you may have been told by a world of secularism and naturalism, that you are actually more special to God than that tree out there or that bird over there or your kitty cat sitting in the windowsill. You are actually more special to God than every other created thing on planet Earth, aside from every other human being. You're more special to God than them. Because you have this set of qualities that they don't have. The cats and the dogs and the horses don't sit around thinking deep spiritual thoughts. Now, in their own way, they glorify God by following their instincts. In their own way, the birds glorify God, like Jeremiah pointed out in his prophecy, that you see the storks and the other birds, they migrate and they lay their eggs and they do what God tells them to do. And they glorify God in the sense that they, they're obeying their design by God. But the birds and the cats and the dogs don't sit here and commune with God and relate to God the way that we do. But then something happened. And you get to Genesis chapter 3, and sin interrupts that communion. Adam and Eve lost something when they sinned. And it is only by grace that the dignity is restored. So that somebody like Paul can go from being the least to being an apostle. Or as he points out in our passage for the day, the greatest of all sinners to being a saint. So let's read here in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and we'll read the whole thing. Then we'll go back and make some points kind of word by word, verse by verse and make some applications. But notice here in our text, 1 Timothy chapter 1 beginning in verse 12, the apostle writes... I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was previously a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance or in unbelief. I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are found in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners among whom I am foremost. 
Yet for this reason I found mercy, so that in me as the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever Amen. And that's a statement that every one of us can say amen to. Because if you're anything like me, you read this passage and you go, Paul, I'm right there with you. I am right there with you. You know, the sins that embarrass me the most are my own sins. I'm not that embarrassed by your sins. Now, I think that that makes it so, probably that's how it should be, is so that we can relate to each other and talk to each other and that you can, you know, you can come to me when go out for coffee and you can talk about what's going on in your life. Like, I'm not, I'm not embarrassed for your sins necessarily, but my sins, <laughs> my sins give me a red face. I blush over my sins. My sins are awful. And there are times that I don't feel worthy to be a Christian, let alone to be a preacher and stand before you and talk like I've got my life all figured out, my spiritual life set in order. I am right there with Paul here in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And yet, just like with Paul, God considered me worthy and faithful. And you too. That's pretty staggering. It's staggering to think that God looked at the Apostle Paul and said, all right, what do we got to work with here? All right, we've got this Saul of Tarsus cat. Let's, let's take a look at this here. Uh, all right, uh, violent aggressor and a blasphemer and a persecutor of the church. But you know what? In, among all the bad stuff, you know what God did? He kind of picked through the, the bad stuff and he said, hey, but give him credit. He's diligent. We can work with that. Hey, give him credit. He's, he's enthusiastic. I can work with enthusiastic. You can't doubt that Saul of Tarsus, he's got a lot of zeal. I mean, you know, he's got zeal for like taking people in chains to have them beheaded. I, I, I get that. Yes, I understand that. But we can work with zeal. And I love this idea that, that Paul is acknowledging like he considered me faithful like I was a violent persecutor of the church. I hated Christians, and I hated Jesus of Nazareth, and I wanted nothing more than for the name Jesus of Nazareth to never be spoken ever again in history. And yet God looked at me and said, okay, I get that, but you've got some stuff I can work with. God sees the same in you. I get it. You've got a lot of embarrassment in your past. There's, there is plenty for you to be ashamed of. We'll not mince words about that. I am ashamed of my past. You should be ashamed of your past too. There is plenty that you have to be ashamed of. But mixed in with all the stuff you're ashamed of, God looks at you and goes, yeah, but you're really smart. And I can use, I can use a smart person like you. Yeah, but you're very, you're very compassionate. And I need more compassionate people in my church. You're hardworking. Hey, I can use more hard workers in my church. I told my apostles a long time ago that the field is white for harvest. The only thing I'm missing is workers to get out there in the fields and work. God looks not just at your horrible qualities. God also looks at your good qualities too and says we can put that into service. And it is God that gives us our purpose and our meaning. Most people only define themselves by the measures of a corrupt world, which is why we define ourselves by our careers and our economic status or our race or our nationality. We define ourselves in worldly ways because that's the only way we know to define ourselves. And God comes in and says, Saul of Tarsus, persecutor of the church, Pharisee of Pharisees, a Benjamite, a zealot, Saul of Tarsus. Let me open up to a new page in the dictionary and redefine what you think you are. And it's something you never thought you were. And it's something you never thought you could be. I want to show you a brand new definition of what you are supposed to be. What is mankind, after all? Are we just garbage? 
Are we just garbage that God wants to discard? Does he look at you and says, oh, there's, just nothing. I, there's nothing to work with there. I can't do anything with you. Or does God take a look at mankind as is pointed out in Hebrews chapter 2 and says, that's something noble. I know they're lost in sin and I know that they're corrupted by that sin, but there's still there's something noble about mankind that I can work with. And he quotes from Psalm 8 there in Hebrews chapter 2. But what is man, after all? What is man? Let's go ahead and read it here. If you want to turn to Hebrews chapter 2, and I want to read it here. And again, he's quoting here from the Psalms. Hebrews chapter 2, and in verse 6 it says, One has testified somewhere saying, What is man that thou rememberest him, or the son of man that thou art concerned about him? Thou hast made him for a little while lower than the angels. Thou hast crowned him with glory and honor, and hast appointed him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet. What? You mean mankind? You crowned us with glory and honor and you put the world in subjection to our feet? You know what we do? We pollute the world and we destroy it and we kill things. Well, that's one definition, I suppose. But that's not God's definition. Yeah, but we mess up everything and we sin and we hurt each other and we abuse each other. We're liars. Oh, that's one definition. Yeah, that's, that's one definition of mankind. But that's not God's definition. Yeah, but we're just physical beings on a tiny speck in the universe that's headed for nowhere, and eventually the sun is going to blow up anyway and kill all living beings. In the Well, that's one definition. Okay, that's, well, we're just descended from apes, and we're nothing better than any other animal out there, so you might as well live like an animal while you're here on earth. You live once after all. Well, that, okay, that's one definition, but that's not God's definition. You want to know what man is? What is man? He asks a question. What is man? And what is man that you remember him? Among all the other things that you've made in this great big beautiful world with mountains and trees and amazing beasts and creatures, what is man that you think anything of him? He's the one creature that you made in your image. And you crowned him with glory and honor. And you put him in charge of a planet. Don't define yourself by the way that other people define you. Don't define yourself the way that the sinners define you. Don't define yourself the way that Satan defines you. As a failure or a lost cause or just an animal acting like an animal. Define yourself the way God wants to define you. For by the grace of God, I am what I am. I let God decide what I am. I let God decide what I'm capable of. He sets my limitations, not the discouraging influences that surround me. Now, Paul, Paul goes on to say in our text, in verse 13, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy. Paul didn't define himself by the past because the past is now obsolete. Obsolete like old technology. Yes, obsolete, obsolete, like that sippy cup full of milk that got put in the sink and then forgotten about for three days. <laughs> the other day, I pulled the cap up. <laughs> That's how you make cottage cheese. If I am truly a new creature, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, then I have moved on from my past. I am not defined by the past. I am not defined by the mistakes that I have made. Not even, not even God remembers my past the way that I do. Now, I understand that God is omniscient. He doesn't literally forget about the past. But look at the sentiment that he expresses in Jeremiah 31. For I will forgive them of their sins and remember them no more, he says of the new covenant. Now, again... He's omniscient. He doesn't literally like forget about the things that you do. But in the sense of what he holds you to, in the sense of what you're accountable to on the judgment day, I will forgive them of their sins and remember them no more. We have a much harder time forgetting about the past than God does. 
The sins that God forgave us of 20 years ago, we still sit and squirm over. I can think about times in my life, and I'm sure you can also, moments in my life where when I sit and think about it, I still blush at the stupid things that I did and the people that I hurt and the words that I said. There are moments in my life that I have not yet forgotten about. Though I believe God has forgiven me long, long ago, I still cling on to them foolishly. I admire the way that Paul is able to own up to this past. I admire the way that Paul owns up to it says, I was all of these things, and I know it. And I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to lie about it. I was those things. Yet, I was shown mercy. And we're all shown mercy because of the potential that God sees within us. God does not merely see my list of sins, which certainly do exist. Make no mistake about that. But God also sees incredible yet misguided energy and talents. I've always loved the way that Jesus talks about Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9. When he's talking to Ananias about this fellow, Saul of Tarsus is about to come and be a house guest of his. Ananias is a little, uh, he's a little hesitant. Although, you mean the Saul of Tarsus that's been persecuting us? That, that Saul of Tarsus that if he knew I was a Christian would probably kill me? That that Saul of Tarsus. And Jesus says, yes. And I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake because he's a chosen instrument of mine. Yes, Jesus sees a persecutor, but like I said earlier in the lesson, Jesus also sees, hey, he's got zeal. He's got enthusiasm. He's smart. We can use that. Put that, it's not a matter of everything about Saul of Tarsus being bad. It's just a matter of him being directed to the bad ends. You've got a ton of talents. God just wants you to redirect that energy toward the right things. And I think that that is the power that grace can have over us. A grace that he mentions is more than abundant grace. That's a great phrase, by the way, isn't it? That's a great phrase. His grace proved to be more than abundant. Uh, I like the idea of when it comes to grace, that grace is not just like God is having to like portion it out a little bit. There was an event yesterday with the, uh, the young people, all the, the preteens got together at someone's house and, and somebody very smartly brought a tray of homemade brownies and it was the only homemade dessert and those brownies went fast. I think, I think someone told Joe, it was, like, it was almost like they vaporized. <laughs> you know, like you, you, took, you took the aluminum foil off and, the, and they vaporized. You know, with God's grace, it's, it, it's not a matter of like, well, I don't know, did we bring enough? Did we bring a big enough tray of brownies to the event? We'll have to divide them. It, I'll have half of one because they're too rich for me anyway. That's not what it is with God's grace. It is more than abundant grace. Plenty of grace. It abounds. There's always enough of it. He's never going to run out. Don't worry. You don't have to be bashful at the table of God's grace and say, well, I don't think I really should take two spoonfuls of that. There's always plenty of grace. Way more grace that God has than deviled eggs at a buffet. There's never enough deviled eggs. The deviled eggs are always gone. It is more than abundant grace. Now, this takes us back to another lesson, though. If you go back to 2 Corinthians 12, there's a passage here in 2 Corinthians 12 where Paul shares a little more insight about this grace that he was enjoying. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and in this context, he talks about a thorn in the flesh that was given to him, a thorn in the flesh that was meant to keep him from exalting himself. And of this thorn in the flesh, he prays three times, asking that God would remove that thorn in the flesh. And God's answer in verse 9 is, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. So Paul's response to that answer is, Well, 
Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses that the power of Christ may dwell in me. And I'm well content, he says in verse 10, with weaknesses and insults and distresses and persecutions. I am strong. Grace that abounds. Grace that is more than abundant. Grace that is always going to be sufficient for you. And it's a trustworthy statement, he says there in verse 15, back in our text in 1 Timothy 1. And it deserves full acceptance that Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost. Part of finding definition in Christ is in accepting that the past is what it is. Grace changes us, but that doesn't mean we're allowed to pretend the past didn't happen. I am the foremost of all sinners. And I'll own that. And in my own self-assessment, I'm not talking in Paul's shoes here. I'm talking in my shoes here. Of all the people in this room, when I look in the spiritual mirror, I am the one who deserves grace the least. I deserve it a lot less than all of you. And I'm not just saying that. I, I'm not just... It's not some empty gesture. I'm telling you, when I look in the spiritual mirror, I deserve grace a lot less than all of you. And I deserve to be up here preaching a lot less than all of you. The past is what it is, and we have to be honest about what the past is and what it did to us and what the past costs us. Or, more properly, what the past costs God. Because it was God who gave his only begotten son, not me. And there's beauty in that. Our lives become these gripping, thrilling stories. No matter how bad your past is, no matter how awful you used to be, whatever your life was like, the fact that you get to come back from that by grace and get a brand new definition and be a living, a new creature, reborn, the, the fact that you get to experience right now what Nicodemus could only see vaguely in the darkness in John chapter 3 makes your life an incredible, incredible story. And so I found mercy. I found mercy. Now, we've got to bring our lesson to a close with a couple quick practical applications. I don't want to leave you without some application here. And we'll go through these in just a few minutes here. First of all, I need to define myself by God's standards, not humanity's standards. Morally, doctrinally, in my behavior, in my language, I don't do the right thing because the world says it's the right thing or it's just the right thing like by comparison. Like, well, at least I'm better than my neighbor, right? At least I'm better than that person. Or at least I'm not Adolf Hitler, which is always the go-to. Like, isn't that always a, well, good for you. At least you're not as bad as Adolf Hitler. I'm glad that that's the bar you've set for yourself, morally speaking. No, I need to define myself by God's standard, not man's standard. Second, I need to feel reconciliation and relief from my past. How can I have a healthy self-definition if I always let my demons run wild? Yes, the past is what it is. You did those things. It's on record. It's there. I get that. But don't let that demon attack you every single day. Don't let what is in the past become the present again and again and again. Let the past be the past. Number three, look for the silver lining in the past and in your experiences. Did my sinful experiences teach me something? Am I, am I the person I am today, at least in part, because this path has taken me to this destination? Can I use my past to teach other people? Do the sins of my past become like these valuable life lessons that I can share with other people to promote the gospel? That's a very important point. And finally, fourth application, Jesus will never be surprised by what you throw at him. I always tell people when they come to my office and seek counseling of some kind, they say, Ryan, I need to talk to you about something really difficult and I'm kind of embarrassed by it and I'm having a hard time. 
You know what I always tell people when they come into my office and say, there is nothing you can say that will shock or surprise me. Preaching for 20 years kind of does that, where, yeah, I've, I've kind of heard it all. Like, there's not really anything, after 20 years, there's not really anything you can tell me anymore that, that shocks me. And I just want you to know, if you ever need to talk to me about something in your life, a sin that you're dealing with, if you come and talk to me, I'm not going to be shocked by it. And neither is God. So let's be real. God already knows you did it. You know, like, why do we find it so hard to confess to God when God, like, actually, literally watched you do it? He was not shocked or surprised when David sinned with Bathsheba. He was not surprised at all when Judas took 30 pieces of silver. It was not like a slap me in the face. I did not see that coming when you sinned yesterday or the day before. God's not shocked by anything. He's seen it all, and he is the one who is most uniquely qualified to judge you with fairness and with love because Hebrews chapter 2 says Jesus came in the flesh just like you're in the flesh. Jesus came in the flesh so that he could relate to us and be a sympathetic high priest to us who has experienced our same weaknesses and limitations and yet has gotten through those same weaknesses and limitations sinlessly. I'd love it if you talk to me if you need to. But get right with Jesus first. Because nobody will help you redefine who you are more and better and more eternally than Jesus. Now, if you're not a Christian here this morning, it's time to listen to the gospel message. You've probably heard it a time or two in the past. Maybe you haven't. And I'll keep it very simple for you. Believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's the same confession Peter makes in Matthew chapter 16. Acknowledge that belief before other people, like Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10. If you confess my name before others, I'll confess your name before the Father. Be willing to put a life of sin behind you, like Peter told those folks in Acts chapter 2. Brethren, what must we do? Repent. And, he says, be baptized. Jesus said we need to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit so that we can truly become disciples of His. And if you've heard that message and you're ready to acknowledge it and obey it, you can be Christian today. Brand new definition. You can go from being nasty Kroger brand to the real thing. Your life can become a savor to God. Your whole life, a sweet aroma, a sacrifice of faith, this very day. So whatever spiritual need you might